We've all noticed a sophomore season glow up the majority of Real Housewives go through. They've had a chance to see themselves on TV and gain new insight into themselves, which often warrants changes, both in behavior and looks. I'm still in awe of the complete 180 Camille Grammer made in terms of her behavior, and we've had many women make tweaks in their appearances so they feel a bit more camera ready. There have, however, been a select few housewives who have taken the feedback they've gotten in their first season and destroyed any goodwill they had initially garnered. So in this video, I want to look at a few of these women and talk about what went wrong and how their legacy changed with their sophomore edition. I'm going to take off points, especially if they were well received in their first season. Also, just a warning, there will be positive talk about some housewives who are universally reviled. I found that when I'm watching a season for a specific housewife, I always begin to sympathize with them and they usually end up winning me over. But let's get to the list. Let's start with the OG franchise and discuss Miss Alexis Jesus Jugs Bellino, who joined the show in season 5. Even though the show took a major course change the prior season, season 5 was where we really entered the modern era with the show. Alexis joined as a replacement for Gina Keogh a few episodes into the series, leaving Vicki Gunvalson as the last OG standing, a title she'd hold on to dearly for her duration on the show. Welcome to my world. Thank you. <laughs> Alexis fulfilled a lot of stereotypes of what viewers may have expected in a housewife, as she came off as kind of a bimbo trophy wife, but in a good way. She had massive boobs, a rockin' body, and gorgeous hair. She happily touted the benefits of plastic surgery and was super flashy with her wealth. She was also an incredibly devoted wife to her husband Jim, who is 15 years her senior. They were strong Christians and had what they refer to as a traditional marriage, meaning he went out and made the money while she stayed home and tended to him and their three kids with the help of multiple nannies. With the women, she did very well. This was in the height of Tamara vs. Gretchen, and she played kind of a floater game, being friends with both of them and seeing both sides. She feels compelled to bring them together. It's my dying desire to like bring them back together. She doesn't get very involved in the drama, though we see her become unhinged at Gretchen's Tupperware drag party when she thinks another woman is flirting with Jim. The only housewife she had issues with was Vicky, who she was scared to meet. Vicky is pulling her usual antics this season, demeaning the others for not working and snoring during long-winded stories, and when the ladies take a quick trip to San Francisco, Alexis reaches her breaking point. Vicky had gotten annoyed that she was on the phone in the middle of dinner, so when Vicky does the same thing the next day, Alexis decides to say something. She leads the charge on Gang Up on Vicky Day right in front of Vicky's daughter Brianna, leaving Vicky in tears, but things turn out okay and Alexis ends the day by saying an iconic prayer for Brianna who is awaiting medical test results. This is Alexis's big moment of the season, but she stays relevant all year. She's kind of the comedy and the levity on what's a really dark season, with Lynn Curtin's daughter going off the rails and being served an eviction letter on camera, Brianna's health issues, and Tamara's marriage dissolving. There definitely seems to be a control factor in the Bellino's marriage, but it isn't focused on too heavily. I think Tamara saw a lot of herself in Alexis, especially with regards to her marriage. She commented often that Jim and Tamara's husband Simon were similar in the ways they behaved, with things like not letting their wives travel alone. I have to wonder if seeing Alexis's and Jim's marriage was the push she needed to split from him, as this was the season that ended with her telling him that she wanted to get a divorce. Everyone besides Vicky left the season liking her, and she was mostly the comic relief, which is why it was clear something had changed when season 6 opened up. Her scenes show her constantly being humiliated and disrespected by her husband. Even though we saw glimpses of this the prior season, we saw a lot of whining and dining too. There's one scene in Alexis's second year where the two go shopping for jewelry. Alexis is giddy with the thought of the bling she's about to get, which would make the slaving around she needed to do on vacation worth it. Instead, Jim buys himself two watches and Alexis leaves empty-handed. They've also really leaned into the Christian aspect of Alexis. They have her constantly talking about the Bible and scriptures, often in ways that make it sound like she doesn't really know what she's talking about. The Bible says that a man's role is to be the head of the household and the wife is to be second. You can tell the producers are having fun with the questions they're asking her. Things start off fine with the other women. She's still feuding with Vicky and trying to play peacekeeper between Tamara and Gretchen, but a wrench is thrown into the plan when she brings on an old friend, Peggy Tanos. It's clear right away that the two are incredibly competitive with each other, especially over their kids. London's completely, like, potty trained. James was potty trained in, like, two weeks. The tension between the two builds and builds until they have an epic showdown at the finale party, and it's revealed that Peggy used to date Jim, which is obviously very upsetting to Alexis. Things also go south with Tamara when Alexis hosts a spa party, and Tamara jokes that she didn't have to use the mace she brought because things with Gretchen went all right. For some reason, this enrages Alexis and sets off a feud with Tamara, who thinks the whole thing is ridiculous. She stays fixated on the 
this mace thing for far too long, destroying her relationship with Tamara, who also has a bit of a gripe with her because she's heard that Jim has been bashing her and feels that Alexis has not been as warm to her since the divorce. Pretty much everyone but Gretchen turns on her when she has a meltdown at a dinner party hosted by Peggy over being apart from Jim for the night. He had decided that he didn't want to be around the other ladies after Vicky called him a smelly dork in a confessional the prior season, which is shocking to the other ladies as the previous season he wouldn't let her breathe on her own. She tells us that things have changed and he's even letting her work outside of the home as she launches her own dress line, Alexis Couture. Couture is a term put on a design, a, a dress, if it's, um, I guess, super rich. This was a point of contention with fans, as we saw her treat the designer like trash. Cutting the sleeves off a dress, she spent hours sewing as she cries out in anguish. It really seems like production sought to bury her this season. She's shown constantly being humiliated by the other women, by herself, and most of all, by her husband, Jim. She gets this full confessional denouncing women's rights. The problem with liberal America today is that this is the decade of, of being so liberal and women being able to run for president and women being able to do everything that a man can do. One, two, three. And excuse me, but I'm a woman woman and I'm made for my husband's ribs and is shown having zero control over her children. It's such a 180 that I have to wonder if there's some truth to Heather Dubrow's claims a season later that Alexis was rude to production because they did absolutely no favors to her this season. Even with this god-awful edit, Alexis remains an icon to me and would deliver one of the greatest performances of all time the next season. I think a lot of this stuff was really as a result of Jim. The fact that she couldn't speak too deeply about a lot of the biblical talk makes me think that she was parroting his talking points. He was also majorly about Flash, so I think while she's certainly materialistic on her own, as most housewives are, a lot of this changing of cars and houses and all of that came as a result of his decisions, not Alexis's. And a lot of the mistreatment of the other women and staff is probably largely to blame for the frustration she was feeling over not having any control at home. It doesn't make it right, and it's never okay to treat people poorly, but I think it could be an explanation as to why she was acting out. I would absolutely love to see Alexis back now that she's split from Jim. We got to see her back briefly in season 14 when she had lunch with Emily, but only got a brief update. She's in a new relationship and appears happy on social media, so I'd love to see a new and improved Jesus Jugs. Next, let's talk about Teddy Mellencamp, one of the most actively despised housewives of all time. She joined Beverly Hills in season 8, staying on the show for two more seasons. The most notable thing about her when she joined was that she was the daughter of rock star John Cougar Mellencamp. She's introduced by Dorit via a child's music class, and the women don't really give her the time of day until they find out who her dad is. I thought this was an interesting move to bring in the daughter of someone famous. We'd seen women who were already famous on the show, as well as the wives of famous people, so it was a new twist on the proximity to celebrity, but I think it kind of fell flat with Teddy. Her father wasn't ever seen on the show, and she seems to have lived a fairly normal life growing up. I did like the random glimmers of insight we got about having a famous father through Teddy's time on the show, but they were relatively sparse. Even though Dorit brought her on the show, it didn't take long until they began to go at it, mostly about the lowest Jake's drama imaginable, such as Dorit being late to drinks and Teddy not providing proper glassware. Erica and Rinna perk up mildly when they hear who Teddy's dad is, but quickly lose interest until Erica and Teddy begin feuding, again over very low stakes issues. Teddy hosts the women at her beach house and is offended when Erica decides to stay at a hotel. Teddy later accuses Erica of having pretend amnesia, causing Erica to give echoes of Hong Kong in her disproportionately aggressive reaction. No, excuse me, don't ever say I'm pretending because I'm not pretending. I'm telling you the truth. I don't remember saying that. Don't ever say that to me again. Okay. Don't f with me like that. You don't want that. Don't. Okay. Don't ever, ever do that. It's really LVP and Kyle who see the beauty in Teddy with her ability to be a faithful soldier in their ongoing Cold War. LVP first connects with her over their love of horses, and LVP quickly brands Teddy with pet status, literally cooing at her during her birthday get-together. LVP seems super eager to take her under her wing, and we have many scenes of the two of them getting tea, but they don't have a lot of natural chemistry, and things feel a little more forced. With Kyle, however, there's a natural pull between the two. Teddy allows Kyle to fill a more big sister type of role, and the two connect over their anxiety. Kyle also helps Teddy with getting the housewife's look, taking her shopping and helping her with the glam type of stuff. I think this season Teddy was fine. This was one of the worst seasons of Beverly Hills, with nothing all that exciting happening, which could be part of the reason why Teddy is often equated with being boring. She didn't add any jazz to the show. She wasn't really funny or glamorous or controversial. She was kind of just there. Not a fan favorite, but not yet the most hated housewife. 
So on to her sophomore season. So Teddy has a bit of a glow up coming in and is firmly aligned with Kyle and LVP and is strongly anti-Dorit. After loading her up for a year, LVP ostensibly decides it's time for her soldier to work and according to Teddy, had her slyly made aware that Dorit had adopted a dog from LVP's latest venture, Vanderpump Dogs, only to rehome it after it nipped PK and the kids, having it ultimately end up in a kill shelter. Teddy is tasked with bringing the situation up on camera and begins doing so, but aborts mission when she realizes that LVP is setting herself up as the hero and delineating Teddy as the bad guy. When the women take an early trip to the Bahamas and Rinna finds out about the situation, she gets flashbacks to Munchausen Gate from season 6 and tells Kyle and Teddy she thinks this is a case of Vander puppeteering. The situation comes up at the dinner table in front of everyone and Teddy is fully turned against Lisa. The two go on to verbally spar and Teddy really stands her ground and produces texts from LVP's employee John Blizzard backing up the idea that Lisa wanted Teddy to know what had happened so she could bring it up on camera. Vanderpump denies these claims and produces text messages of her own with evidence that Teddy was a willful participant in bringing Dorit down. Teddy owns up to this and apologizes to Dorit, who ultimately takes her side. Things combust between LVP and the other women when an article comes out on Radar Online revealing the situation, suspiciously from LVP's point of view. LVP stops filming with the group after the fallout from this and eventually leaves the show when she chooses not to show up to the reunion. LVP was a major fan favorite, and despite the situation occurring largely as a result of her own choices, fans were devastated to see her go. For some reason, Dorit, the other person really at fault here, also skirted a lot of responsibility, and fans largely blame Teddy, which I think is a bit unfair due to the situation, but I think it's mainly that Teddy doesn't have as exciting of a personality and is less entertaining than LVP or Dorit. I like that Teddy stood her ground against LVP and took accountability for her own part in the situation. She was pretty forthcoming with her original intention to take Dorit down. I can respect someone owning up to bad intentions and actions and taking measures to rectify them. To be fair, she did have clear backup from Erica and Rinna and implicitly from Kyle, so she wasn't standing alone. I think this came across as unpopular for a few reasons. First off, despite the frustration the ladies had been feeling with Vanderpump, the audience was still and seems to still be on her side. Lisa has such a dynamic, fun personality and brings so much color with her wherever she goes that seeing her leave the show, even if it really was her own doing in my opinion, was very unpopular with the fans. Teddy was seen as the catalyst in making this happen and certainly got a lot of hate for it. To make matters worse, after LVP is gone, the women immediately turn on Camille and take her down as well. The next season, they would go on to do the same thing to Denise Richards. Even though Teddy wasn't alone in this, she was often the catalyst in a lot of these situations getting started, and we were seeing the fan favorites leaving. I think Teddy and Season 9 are largely associated with the formation of the Fox Force 5, a super alliance consisting of Teddy, Kyle, Erica, Dorit, and Lisa Rinna that's massively unpopular with fans. A lot of these women are fine on their own, but together they've gotten super powerful and are a bit insufferable as, like I mentioned, they've targeted fan favorites to the point where they've left the show, and they refuse to go after each other about anything with more substance than Dorit being long-winded. I think this is a fair criticism of Teddy, but obviously the problem transcends her as it is lingered past her time on the show. I think people aren't too keen on Teddy's personality as well. She's accused of being a know-it-all and getting involved in other people's businesses. These aspects don't really bother me, but what does is her business all in with Teddy, which has come out as essentially an eating disorder boot camp where clients are expected to consume an alarmingly small amount of calories daily and send weigh-ins while at funerals. I really, really hate this, but it's never delved into all that much on the show, in part because the Fox Force 5 would never go after their own, and also because a lot of the truly alarming reports started coming out just as Teddy was fired from the show. Aside from this, I don't hate Teddy the way fans often seem to. Sure, she's kind of a nag and she's definitely a know-it-all, but I think the level of hate being lobbed at her is a bit over the top. I think at this point, it's kind of just become fun to hate on Teddy, and it's an easy train to jump on. I wouldn't call myself a fan of hers per se, but I thought she was great during her short time on Celebrity Big Brother 3, and I enjoy her podcast with Tamara. She actually mentioned on there once that when she was slated to join the show, she had the choice between OC and Beverly Hills, choosing Beverly Hills as it's a bit bigger. I kind of think she might have done better on OC. She definitely doesn't have the glam factor needed to thrive on Beverly Hills, but her horse girl ways could have gone over a bit better on the more casual Orange County. The timeline dictates that she would have joined around the time Gina and Emily did in season 13. Given how close she is to Tamara and the fact that she seems to be a good sidekick type of figure, I think we could have seen a similar relationship between them eventually form on the show. I don't know if I'm super eager to have Teddy back on the show, but I don't mind seeing her pop up here and there, and I do really enjoy hearing her on her podcast, even if she's not able to talk about Beverly Hills in an objective way. I can't hold that over her though, I probably wouldn't be able to either. 
Next, let's talk about Bronwyn Wyndham Burke, who joined the OC Ladies in season 14 as an all out super fan of the show. She mentioned in Not All Diamonds and Rose that she literally fangirled over meeting Tamara, which is relatable. What wasn't relatable is that she was the mother of seven kids, claiming that it was really for no reason. She just likes having kids, though we get a little bit more insight into the true reason the next season. She actually had it pretty easy when meeting the ladies. She came in as a friend of Kelly Dodds, and Shannon enjoyed her right away, as did Tamara, who saw her as a mini me of sorts. Sports. The three bonded over a love of partying. She wasted no time getting involved with Vicky versus Kelly, who were trading low blows, siding firmly with Kelly, kicking off her feud with Vicky, in which the OG of the OC gave her an unfortunate and frankly inaccurate nickname. Boring Win um, is going. What'd you call her? Somebody said her name was Boring Win. No, you just said it. No, I- Her personal storyline this season was mainly about her daughter Rowan's past struggles and current aspirations to be a fashion designer, as well as the complicated relationship with her own mother, the literally colorful Dr. Deb. I found this dynamic to be fascinating. Bronwyn tells us that her mother had dreams of stardom, forcing Bronwyn to grow up in bars and under the care of her grandparents, which left Bronwyn feeling a bit untethered and unloved. I will admit that I'm not really a fan of Dr. Deb. She seems to be pretty cruel to Bronwyn and seems to be more focused on her relationships with strangers over her own daughter. She's pretty dismissive when Bronwyn tries to talk to her about her feelings, but I understand that there's got to be some level of feeling weird that this is happening on camera, so who knows if it would have gone better had it happened in a more private setting. Bronwyn also exerted a lot of energy telling us how sexy her relationship was with her husband, Sean, showing off her sex pad, and talking about the gift he gets for milestone birthdays. Her and Tamara grew very close, joking that they were dating. We also saw that Bronwyn was incredibly messy. On an early season shopping trip to Beverly Hills, Tamara confronts Bronwyn about texting with her nemeses, Gretchen and Lizzie, and Bronwyn lies saying that they contacted her. Emily Simpson Esquire enters Exhibit A, text showing that Bronwyn reached out to them, and we saw Bronwyn's go-to plan of action, which was to own up to it profusely and run off crying. Tamara can't stand to see her so upset and comforts her, getting back into the woman's good graces. You can tell that there's not a huge respect factor here as she continuously gets thrown under the bus this season and acts as kind of a rat, telling Kelly immediately when the Trace Amigas were gossiping about her in a bar fight and instigating drama between Gina and Emily. She is also kind of the catalyst in the attempted Tamara takedown, which fails, and crawls right back to Tamara when she gives her some one-on-one attention. Her all-star performance this season was at Vicky's Tea Party birthday party, where she grates on every last one of Gina's nerves. And you do public school, right? Bronwyn was fine this season. Fans, myself not included, were mostly fixated on Tamara and Vicky leaving, and Bronwyn kind of floated by, not being a fan favorite, but there weren't demands for her to leave. Yet. This would all change a year later with Bronwyn's sophomore season, season 15. When the show begins, some things have changed while others have remained the same. She kicks off the drama by gossiping to anyone who will listen that Gina has the smallest, saddest, most depressing house of all time, while she's living large in a brand new mansion equipped with a pirate ship and a nightclub. When this gets back to Gina, she owns up to it but implicates Shannon in the whole thing who swears up and down that she would never say that, which none of the other ladies buy. The biggest change for Bronwyn is that she's come to terms with her alcohol addiction and slowly reveals the information to the other women until it all comes out in a fury at Shannon's housewarming party after Gina calls her a sloppy chihuahua. I'm 30 days sober today, bitch! Sending Bronwyn on a rampage, insulting everyone in her path. Hey, cut, um, lemonade boy, could you get my husband? From there, the women are torn with how to treat her as they want to be supportive of her sobriety while still keeping her accountable for the reign of terror she's bestowing upon them. For the rest of the season, Bronwyn is an emotional roller coaster, having meltdowns and tantrums while also having moments of wisdom and stability. To make matters worse, COVID hits and she along with the rest of the women really struggle with it. I think this is the season that most rawly captures the pandemic as it hits midway through and we see the evolution from Shannon freaking out about Amazon selling out of toilet paper. Wipes because you bought it all. To production shutting down, to Shannon and Emily missing the low-key cash trip to Lake Arrowhead as they had COVID. I think at the time of airing, it was much too raw as we were still in the midst of the pandemic, but I think we will start appreciating it more and more as time moves forward for the time capsule that it provides us. This season also features the Black Lives Matter protests that erupted in the wake of the murder of George Floyd in the summer of 2020. While all of the ladies show support for the movement, Bronwyn launches the most into it, feeling like she'd spent most of her life living in ignorance. The other ladies find it to be contrived, accusing her of hiring a professional photographer to capture her and her children protesting, and the undercurrent is that she's throwing them under the bus a bit, claiming that she's the only one who actually cares, which they disagree with. 
By the finale beach party, it's clear that the other women absolutely despise Bronwyn. Another undercurrent this whole season is Bronwyn's sexuality. She'd seemed quite taken the previous season with Tamra, as well as the female stripper at her weaning party, but as season 15 progresses, it's clear that there are major issues with her relationship with her husband, Sean. She's spending a lot of time with her friend Shari, who she tells us is her sober companion of sorts, jokingly, question mark, referring to her as her wife. She talks around her lack of attraction to Sean, both in confessionals and in conversations with the other women, until the finale when she finally reveals that she's come to terms with the fact that she's a lesbian. She came out in the press in early December, around the time COVID hit on the show, just after the episode where she renewed her vows. So all of this is to say that there was a lot going on with Bronwyn, and I know some viewers and perhaps some housewives felt that some of it was a bit put on or manufactured, but I actually think there's a lot of order in this chaos. First off, her sobriety completely makes sense. She'd had a year of seeing herself on TV, watching back her drunken antics, and she did get majorly sloppy several times on season 14. She was also given a lot of opportunities to party as a result of being on the show, and was able to read other people's takes on her behavior. Coupled with the fact that she mentions her dad died as a result of alcohol addiction, and she had had a traumatic upbringing, I don't think she's making it up. She speaks about how her affluent lifestyle afforded her the opportunity to let things get out of hand, and she had nannies round the clock to care for the children, so there weren't really any consequences to her drinking. She mentioned that the reason she had so many kids was so that she would be forced into respites away from alcohol. It does make sense. And with her sexuality, it totally tracks that she was using alcohol to bury it. Even though we now live in a society where the mainstream celebrates being gay, this is a relatively recent phenomenon. Bronwyn and Sean also met and married while they were young, so it makes sense that she may not have fully come to terms with the truth, but after watching back what was a very clear attraction to women in season 14, along with no longer being able to numb that out with substances, it tracks that it would become undeniable at that point. I also think her outbursts and tantrums made sense. We saw in season 14 that she hadn't developed strong coping skills. She outright admitted this at the hip-hop dance class with Tamara and Shannon, and without the mask that alcohol provided, coupled with the lack of distractions given in those early quarantine days, all that buried trauma and emotion came bubbling to the surface causing super intense reactions. She also seems to naturally be a bit of a spoiled brat, which can sometimes be funny to watch, but sometimes is a little bit over the line. My biggest qualm was in how she treated her husband, revealing to us that she got physical with him at some point off camera when he wouldn't let her drink. Aside from that, she was generally treating him terribly, demeaning him and putting him down, but I think this could have been for a few reasons. First off, he's the person closest to her, and we often take out our frustrations on the people closest to us that we can trust to still love us despite our flaws. I think there could have also been an element of pushing him away as a result of her sexuality. Kind of a, I'll make him leave me so I don't have to be the bad guy and leave him type of situation. Either way, we were watching this woman go through the ride of her life all on camera, and I think if any of us were dealing with all that she had going on, we probably wouldn't be putting our best face forward either. But viewers were left totally exhausted by her, and it's understandable that she left after this season, especially when Shannon revealed at the reunion that Bronwyn tried to hook her daughter up with a drug dealer to sell her hard drugs. That was definitely a step entirely out of line, and Bronwyn was very apologetic. This is something underrated about her, her ability to own up and take accountability while still remaining messy with the drama. I've appreciated her talking about the addictive aspects of fame since she's left the show as well. I can see why she's unpopular, but while making this video, Bronwyn really grew on me. But let's move on and talk about Leah McSweeney, who joined the Real Housewives of New York in season 12 and bombed her second year in season 13. When she first joined, she was a breath of fresh air. On a series that had long been dominated by preppy, old money, Upper East Side type of vibes, Leah came in as a downtown cool girl. We'd seen glimmers of this with Carol Radziwill, but Leah gave us a more evolved view of this type of New Yorker. She had an edgy vibe. Her tattoos became a point of contention with the other ladies, but she had the right level of chaos and a love of partying that caused her to still click with the women. Tinsley was a good person to bridge the gap between Leah and the veterans, and by the time Tinsley left midway through the season, Leah had built enough of a connection, specifically with Dorinda and Luann, that she still felt natural in the group. Her relationship with Ramona was pretty interesting. Leah was very open about the struggle she had with her mother, especially as she'd recently begun drinking again after years of sobriety, which was a point of concern for her mother. With Ramona, Leah was able to work out some of the issues she had with her mother, and it allowed Ramona to show that maternal side of herself, which works to counteract some of the more unsavory parts about her. The relationship was strained, but we were able to see more well-rounded versions of both women through their interactions with each other. Leah was also a fun narrator in her confessionals and her antics, especially while under the influence brought us some very memorable moments. 
She also had an unconventional family situation, being best friends with her preteen daughter, Kiki, and having an amicable relationship with her ex. She also had a cool professional life with her clothing line, Married to the Mob. With season 12, if you can believe it, Leah was a major fan favorite and seemed to be the future of Roni until season 13 hit. Now, I've gone in depth in some of the issues of season 13 in my video on how to save Roni, but to review, I think we've got to give this season some grace as the world was really down bad when it was filmed. This was the season in the height of pre-vaccine COVID, and New York was locked down a lot more than other places, so the women really couldn't go out and do much of anything. It also had a very small cast with only five full-timers, and the focus was on very heavy issues, specifically racism towards black Americans, which was at the forefront of everyone's mind in the country after the murder of George Floyd. The season was massively unpopular with fans, and Leah was one of the biggest cited reasons why it was negatively received. I think Leah way overestimated her hold on the audience. I think the fan favorite status had gotten to her head a little bit, and she didn't take into consideration that the show is an ensemble. When the ladies head to Ramona's house in the Hamptons early on, she goes hard for Ramona, her biggest gripe being Ramona allegedly lying about donating plasma and going maskless. This was at a time before the vaccine, and COVID protocol shaming was at an all-time high, and rightfully so, as people were dying and getting gravely ill from the virus, so it wasn't an ordinary thing a housewife might go after another one for, but one that was highly contentious and taken more seriously by the audience. She also goes on a tirade against former housewife Heather Holla Thompson, who joined the group as a friend. I remember just how excited people were to have Holla Heather back, but Leah acted totally unhinged against her. She was beyond rude, ignoring her for seemingly no reason, and then brought up headlines taken from Heather's podcast in which she discussed the other women. The others didn't seem primed to go after Heather until Leah basically forced them to by reading them out on camera and not giving Heather much opportunity to provide context in the moment. She's needlessly aggressive to Heather, preemptively yelling at her when Leah reveals she's not sure if she was going to vote in the 2020 election, further angering fans as this was obviously a very heated and important election. The thing was, Heather didn't even say anything. Leah literally just yelled at her based on how she thought she might react. Heather is understandably put off by the whole thing, launching Leah into another unhinged rant where she makes some pretty vicious attacks at Hollow while dressed like Carrie. Everything. Do not talk about me. Do not talk about anything that I say. It's none of your business. Why do you have to be in everyone's business like a Karen? It's none of your business. She did look incredible, I must say. Heather is basically run off the show after this, which was very upsetting to fans. With only five women on the show, during a time where they couldn't really interact much with the outside world, we needed our mama for a bit of stability and another source of tension. Plus, she was more understanding and a better translator for Luann and Ramona when the topic of race came up, which was often. Even though Heather made some gaffes and overly familiarized herself with black culture, she wanted to understand and was able to mediate between Ramona and Lou and Ebony in a way that perhaps Dorinda or Carol would have been able to do had they been on the show. I also felt that Leo was more after the gotcha moment with the others, wanting to set them up to fail. There's a moment where after Ebony and Lou have gotten into an incredibly heated altercation about what it means to be well-educated, in which Lou exploited the angry black woman stereotype Ebony vents to Leah about what has happened. Leah seems almost excited about the fact that Luann has exposed herself in this way before she realizes that Ebony just needs a friend. Ebony is really upset, and Leah does course correct, but that moment seemed a little off to me. Almost like her goal was to make these extremely heavy tensions worse, rather than find a way to move through the pain and come out stronger and more compassionate, as I think the audience would have preferred. It seems as if she wanted to take her cast members down in ways that would not be forgivable to the audience, and now we're seeing that consequence as we're two years without Roni and we have this schism type of situation where we have to separate the two shows. Leah also devotes a lot of energy on this trip to slut-shaming Ramona and generally killing the joy. But it's important to put Leah's terrible, horrible, no-good behavior into a bit of context as she was dealing with her grandmother dying and it hit her incredibly hard. Ramona actually points out, and Leah later confirms this, that Leah's grandmother had been the person she felt closest to, the person that always supported her. We saw through Leah's time on the show that her and her mother had an incredibly strained relationship with a lot of resentment and criticism, clouding the connection between them. And I think Leah struggles to feel unconditional love and support from her mother. Her grandmother had always been that person for her, and with her dying, I can imagine that Leah was feeling like her protection in a hostile world was slipping, and she was feeling totally lost and out of control. She had also stopped drinking, and like Bronwyn, was having to deal with all of this without the ability to numb herself out and with no real escape. She was angry in general and took that anger out on her castmates and knew it was wrong but was powerless to stop it. 
I think this is pretty evident based on the fact that the rest of the season, she wasn't behaving as she did on that first Hamptons trip. Her grandmother died right after she left, and we saw Ramona get very emotional about this. Whenever it comes up for the rest of the season, we see just how much it's devastated Leah. She's no longer out to bring everyone else down and really goes out of her way to have nearly every cast member's back at some point, and her focus shifts to her daughter's private school search. I actually really enjoyed the glimpse we got into this insane process, and we saw her devoting herself to her conversion to Judaism. We saw on election day that she did end up voting, hitting the polls with her boxing coach Martin, who went all in for a very out of left field candidate. We are exercising our right to vote for Dinsdale. She also gets COVID midway through the season, so we have a couple of episodes where we really only see her on FaceTime, most notably when Ebony invites the other ladies to Black Shabbat, and Leah constantly complains that she can't see or hear what's going on on FaceTime. I, for one, do not miss that hybrid thing that people are trying to make work. Her last real bit of drama is with Lou while recording the Countess's Christmas song, in which Leah's very, very concerned about the legalities behind the song, not wanting to miss out on any monetary gain, which is kind of fair given how Luann has treated Sonia in this regard in the past. It's more silly drama and blows over quickly. She's really a lot of fun the rest of this season. My favorite moment being the women's doppelganger night where she gets really into character as Ramona and Ramona gets really into character as Leah. I need some hot c <laughs> Who is hot c we saw especially on this night just how much the two have grown to love and care about each other and their ribbing on the other stays fun and lighthearted. I truly think her big mess up was that Hamptons trip in which her behavior was so over the top and spiteful that it caused a lot of people to check out of this season and write her off. But as I was re-watching and so tuned into her role, I really grew to like her. I've dealt with some pretty devastating grief myself, so I can have compassion and empathy for Leah as I came to realize just how much her grandmother meant to her and how much the loss devastated her. It seems unlikely that we'll see Leah on Roni in either iteration, but after revisiting her time on the show, I'm really looking forward to see her in the Ultimate Girls Trip 3. I think, as with the case with Bronwyn, we really saw her at a very low time in her life, and it was more of an anomaly that unfortunately has become the narrative of who she is as a housewife. And last, the most WTF shift ever, is the woman with the greatest name of all time, Miss Siggy Flicker. I think Siggy was a pretty important housewife when she joined, as she was the first housewife on the show that wasn't Italian. Siggy's backstory is actually way fascinating. She's an Israeli Jew who was born in a bomb shelter during the Six Days War. Her father escaped the Holocaust and is now a professor of religious and Holocaust studies, so this is obviously a very important part of Siggy's backstory. Despite this, she meshes very well with the other ladies, explaining that both cultures honor traditional values meaning she's very subservient to her husband, the always referred to in full name, Michael Campanella. She's a natural fit with the ladies, being very close with Jacqueline and fellow newbie Dolores. The three are a trio of sorts, which pushes Melissa closer with Teresa, who has just gotten out of prison, and is treated with kid gloves by everyone but Jacqueline this season. Teresa and Jacqueline have a roller coaster of a relationship this season, making up, then fighting, then making up, then fighting, and Siggy has made it her mission to get them back together. She's definitely meddling, but it's clear that her intentions are good and people can't really be mad at her. She's got a big personality, causing a scene everywhere she goes, but in a fun way. Everybody, I would like to make an announcement. I breastfed Joshua Flicker. She almost reminded me of Vicky in a bit in that she's over the top and dramatic, but she's so funny in her reactions that you don't care. She also deems herself a relationship expert, though it's unclear what exactly the credentials are, but she's so charming that nobody really questioned it. She's got a very high opinion of herself, constantly referring to herself in third person and touting all of the things she's great at. I give really, really good advice, and there's no better friend. If you're peeing in your pants, I'll wipe your pee. I'll help you decorate, I'll help you organize. I'm a true blue friend. She films most of her solo scenes with her kids, who she seems hell-bent on embarrassing, again, kind of in a Gunvalsonian way. Sophie thinks she's marrying Jason Derulo. She's convinced, oh, she knows every song inside out. We never see her get involved in the drama herself in season 7. She asks Teresa point blank about tabloid rumors about her and Juicy Joe, but Teresa is in her namaste area and doesn't get upset. Again, Siggy comes off as so benign that she gets away with stuff like this. We also see that she gets totally frazzled and fried when Jacqueline gets uber nasty with Melissa and Teresa on their cash trip to Vermont. We should have realized that she crumbles under drama, but we would soon find out just how bad it would get when season 8 opens. So, Siggy has written a book and is making a living giving talks touting her relationship relationship expertise. The advice that comes out of my mouth and what I speak about is soup to nuts, the best thing that you will ever hear. Though Michael Campanella is not into this and that's largely a part of her struggle early on. It's at one of these talks that she introduces newbie Margaret Josephs and invites her to join the ladies on an early season trip to Siggy's homeland, Boca. This woman is so passionate about Boca, it's wild. 
She's pulling her usual antics, causing an absolute scene in public. Oh. But things dissolve when she presents Melissa a birthday cake. I had a pastry chef make a cake that was specific. Like, there's a beautiful picture of Melissa standing in her store with the beautiful wallpaper in the back that the pastry chef copied. After enjoying it, Melissa and Teresa playfully throw it at each other, causing Siggy to see red. She spews a barrage of insults at them, calling them animals and implying they're dumb. Let's not kid each other. My IQ is a lot higher than these girls. Both sides are firm in their opinion that the other is in the wrong and should be the one to apologize. Dolores is firmly team Sig, but the other women are left shell-shocked and unwind with some beachside yoga, where Margaret surprises the other women with an impromptu memorial ceremony for Teresa's mother who has just died. Siggy continues to demean the ladies, scolding them before they visit a friend's house, and when Dolores and Siggy find out about the memorial, they take it as an attack from Margaret and Siggy no longer possesses the ability to see Margaret as anything other than the enemy. This is made all the worse when Margaret deems her soggy flicker, which enrages Siggy, as Margaret should have known that she was bullied because of her name. Siggy also majorly pisses off Melissa, Danielle, and Teresa when she continues to insult them in Boca, though she quickly forgives Teresa when they get back to Jersey and extends an apology towards her. I guess because she's the queen bee. She remains completely incensed towards Margaret, who doesn't even realize that things are so serious, until Siggy rejects an invite to a party Marge is throwing. Instead, she has Dolores over for a mocking Margaret party, and the thing is so unhinged. They feel that Margaret purposefully left them out of the memorial when they chose not to go to yoga. They think that because Siggy brought Margaret into the group, she should be loyal to them, but as we all know, it doesn't mean much for someone to bring another housewife into the group. It's very clear that they didn't know each other before the show, and Margaret is not exactly ride or die, especially for someone who has zero control over their emotions like Siggy. Siggy and Margaret decide to hash out their differences and meet at a diner. Side note, I'm so into how into diner Siggy is. But anyways, things start off bad. Margaret is being icy and Siggy's acting like a lunatic. The two get into a side fight about who knows Joan Rivers more. You know Joan I Rivers? Because I've been to a million parties at her house Honey, before she passed I know away. I did meet her three times, but that's okay. I've been to a million parties at Joan's house, Margaret, and believe me. Why, Margaret, Margaret, you know Joan Rivers better, okay? Yeah. But when Siggy starts crying and opens up a bit, Marge feels bad and the two seemingly come to a civil place. Just when we thought we'd heard the last of Kate Gate, Siggy throws a party in which she seeks an outside opinion on the situation and utterly humiliates Melissa in the process. That's it! Here you go! Melissa, that's all I wanted! That's all! That's all I wanted! That's it! This upsets Melissa and Teresa, but the drama turns to Dolores versus Danielle. Scumbag! No, welcome not. back, scumbag! No, Dolores, no, Welcome not. back, scumbag! Thanks for watching! Later at the Gorga pizza tasting, Siggy decides she hates Margaret again and her hinges leave her body completely. But it turns out it's due to her hormones being out of whack and she admits that she has been a bit soggy and gets pellets in her ass to help regulate her hormones. These kind of work, albeit briefly, and she hosts a test run of her empowerment retreat in which she calls Margaret out in front of a group of strangers and introduces a role-playing event which she's lucky didn't make everything 10 times worse. Through this, she's able to get to a better place with both Margaret and Melissa, though some question if it may have been for show just to prove how effective her retreat is. Either way, everything gets reinvigorated when she and Dolores go see Jersey Menace Kim D as they are planning to walk in the posh fashion show. At the fitting, Kim D spreads rumors that Teresa is cheating on Joe, and when they bring this up at a group dinner, Teresa naturally goes wild and starts throwing things. Siggy and Dolores still plan to walk in the show, which is a step too far for all of the other women, and they come back with the fact that this year is raising money for the families of some guys who died in a very disturbing way. Things aren't clicking with them for why the other ladies are so upset about this, and Margaret commits the most mortal of sins you can commit in Jersey. She makes an analogy. Hitler! Does that make him a good person? Wait, Siggy doesn't seem to react in the moment, and the ladies walk in the fashion show, while all of the other ladies roll up and confront Kim D. After the show, Frank points out that they shouldn't have sided with Kim D, and suddenly things click. Siggy is now latched on to Margaret's Hitler comment, just in time for the ladies to jet set off to Milan. Things erupt immediately when the women sit down for their first dinner and Siggy brings up the Hitler comment. The conversation escalates to the point of Siggy accusing Margaret of being anti-Semitic. This is obviously crazy and a step too far in a totally inappropriate accusation. I get that Siggy is especially sensitive to discussion related to the Holocaust given her heritage and close family history, but Adolf Hitler has become synonymous with evil. If you ask a random person on the street to name the worst person, there's a good chance his name will roll off their tongue. One of the first internet adages is Godwin's Law, which dictates that if an 
internet discussion goes on for long enough, it becomes inevitable that someone or something will be compared to Hitler. And besides, she didn't say anything pro-Hitler or anti-Jew. She was merely saying that just because someone is nice to you doesn't mean that everyone has that experience and someone can be devilish regardless of their interactions with you. I get that it's a very intimately painful topic for Siggy, but the reality is that the Holocaust completely changed the course of history and it's most Westerners' view of what evil is. Anti-Semitism is real and something to be called out, but she cheapens it when she makes these baseless accusations that could have ruined Margaret's relationships had they picked up steam. When she speaks with her father about this issue, he also tells her it's inappropriate, but before this, on the Milan trip, things are obviously still tense. Danielle had taken strays in the fight the previous night and Siggy called her trash. So they two make up and they meet up with Melissa and now Siggy is mad at Margaret for calling her soggy despite knowing she'd had a hysterectomy. I'm not seeing the connection there. She's still maintaining that Margaret shouldn't have brought up Hitler and is mad at the other women for not having her back in this regard. Literally nobody since maybe Dolores has her back, though Dolores admits that this is a step too far when Siggy isn't around. When the group gets back together for a tense dinner, Margaret delivers a very genuine apology where she says she understands that this is a trigger for Siggy, apologizes, and promises never to use his name again. Siggy doesn't say anything. It's incredibly awkward. Next, Teresa is sent in to reason with Siggy. She tries to explain that being called an adulterer, as she has been by Kim D, is worse than being called soggy, but Siggy disagrees. She finally agrees to apologize to Margaret, but when when the time comes, it's incredibly strained, and though they end on a good note, Siggy doesn't seem to think she was really in the wrong here. Which is confirmed when she totally snubs Margaret and her mother at the Gorga Pizzeria opening back in Jersey. Margaret hosts a finale party, and though we see her getting glam to go, rumors begin swirling that Siggy is in the hospital. She eventually shows up equipped with a boot and a sling, insults Margaret at her own birthday party, and gets Teresa and Dolores to leave with her. She announced her departure from the show before the reunion aired, and it didn't go very well for her, but did produce one of the greatest reunion moments of all time. Did Melissa Kim and Teresa build it concentration camps? We don't know. You know we don't know. We it don't was. know. Since her time on the show, Siggy has pledged her allegiance to Donald J. Trump. Being so outspoken about it, she literally had to provide receipts proving she was not at the Capitol riot. This was just god-awful. It's incredible in a bad way how someone could go from being a ray of chaotic light, meddling in a way that improved things, to becoming so, so terrible in the span of a season. I don't know if her hormones truly were out of whack or if there was something else going on off camera that made her so ridiculously sensitive and explosive, but this was just a disaster. She berated everyone but Dolores taking very low blows. Margaret didn't owe her anything and she treated her like dirt, so it's ridiculous to expect her to have any semblance of loyalty. It was unclear why she was so viciously after Margaret. She called Danielle trash and was totally disrespectful to Melissa. She worshipped the ground Teresa walked on, so she always played nice and apologized to her, which demonstrates to me that it was never truly about whatever had upset Siggy that day, but about the status and pecking order on the show. Luckily, the show found fantastic replacements the next season with Jennifer and Jackie, but the transformation of Siggy is just stunning. With all the other women, I felt like watching the show focusing on them, I was able to see where they were coming from and find a way to like them, but with Siggy, I found it really challenging. She did have her moments of silliness this season, such as her fixation with her son going to Penn State, but she really just lost a plot here, at least as I see it. So that's my list. I thought it was interesting to see just how much Bronwyn and Leah's journeys echoed each other. Like I mentioned at the top of the video, I really grew to have love for all of the women as I watched with a lens purely on them, with the exception of maybe Siggy. Let me know what you think of all of these ladies and if there are any more examples of the sophomore slump you can think of. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and give the video a thumbs up if you haven't already. If you want to connect on social media, both of my ads are deeply super fish. I'll put them below, but for now, I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye!